Let me on your behalf uh, welcome back amongst us our good brother uh, Cecil Andrews. And we're really delighted that our brother Cecil has taken the time and come amongst us tonight to preach on the theme of the Reformation. So we do thank you for coming. We do thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate your attendance tonight. There was a man told me earlier, he says, now don't be disappointed if there's under 12 tonight. So I think maybe there's slightly over 12. Brother Cecil said, coming out of the prayer meeting, the Lord started with 12 apostles. So, so that's good. Uh, so if we, we start with this number tonight, then hopefully we'll increase uh, by Friday night. Uh, so do remember the meetings as they continue. Uh, Cecil will be back again uh, tomorrow night. Uh, and then on Wednesday night, the Reverend Greer will be here preaching on the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Thursday night, the priesthood of all believers. And then on Friday night, uh, Mr. Wallace Thompson from the Evangelical Protestants in Northern Ireland, he'll preach on the subject, the reversal of the Reformation. And we've asked the question in the invitation, is it all over? And I want to tell you, many, many people believe in the country that it is all over. And... Um, we need to pray much for the state of our land at this time. Brother Cecil, we're really glad you're here. I'll ask you to come and bring God's word. Thank you. Well, friends, it's a real joy to be back again in Kaida Free Presbyterian Church. And I think it's maybe three or four years since I was last with you. So I want to thank David for his kind invitation to take part in this special week of meetings. Uh, when I was uh, in touch with them earlier this year on the subject of the Reformation, I, I told him that I had a, a two-part presentation. And so he very kindly invited me to come and do that. And then when I went on to the website, I noticed that he had given a title for tonight and a title for tomorrow night. Well, my presentation has actually got four headings. And uh, I hope with his blessing, I'm going to use those four headings uh, tonight I will be speaking on the reasons for the Reformation and then I will be speaking on reaction to the Reformation. So that's for tonight. And then tomorrow night is going to be reversal of the Reformation and rejoicing in the Reformation. Now you've already heard David say that Wallace Thompson is speaking on Friday night and his heading is reversal of the Reformation. Well you'll be glad to know that Wallace and I have been in touch with each other and we are doing our best to ensure that we are not simply repeating what each other is going to say. Uh, he will be addressing the same sort of topic as me, but he'll be coming at it from another angle, and he'll be making other references than those that I will be making tomorrow night. So as Corporal Jones would say, don't panic uh, when you hear uh, that two of us are speaking about reversal. Anyhow, tonight, as I say, we're going to look at the reasons for the Reformation, and reaction to the Reformation. And I want to begin by reading some verses of Scripture. First of all, from the Old Testament in the book of Job. Uh, I want to read all of chapter 25, all six verses. Uh, and then I'm going to read some verses from Paul's letter to the Galatians. But we're going to begin with chapter 25 of Job. Uh, this is one of his comforters, Bildad, who is speaking. And uh, the chapter breaks down neatly into two portions. The first three verses uh, draw us to God's greatness and God's majesty. And then verses 4 to 6 show the great contrast between the high and holy God and the lowly sinfulness of man. So it's Job 25, beginning at verse 1. Then answered Bildad the Shuite and said, Dominion and fear with him, he maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies, and upon whom doth not his light arise? How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less than man that is a worm, and the son of man, which is a worm. So there we see the great high and holy God in the first three verses. And then we see the lowliness of sinful man. And Bildad views him as no better than a worm. 
And then if we turn over to Paul's letter to the Galatians, and I want to read a, a verse from chapter 2, and then a couple of verses from chapter 3. Uh, the reason for this letter to the Galatians was, of course, that Paul was constantly plagued everywhere he went by a group who were, in his opinion, and according to the Word of God, preaching a false gospel, which was no gospel. In other words, it couldn't save anybody. That's what he says in Galatians chapter 1. And he says, in fact, it's under the curse of God. And the problem was these people, these Judaizers, as they were known, were saying that in order to be saved, faith alone in Christ alone was not sufficient. You needed to add to that some religious ritual dating back to Old Testament times. They needed to observe some of the works of the law as well as having faith in Christ. And Paul says in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 2, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And then in chapter 3, uh, Paul adds this in verse 10 and 11. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And that, of course, was the great truth that Martin Luther himself discovered. Now, we've seen, I hope, there are two uh, references, both in the Old Testament that I read and the New Testament, to the word justified. And this word justified, it's very important to know exactly what it means to be justified. And it wasn't too long after I had been converted that I was beginning to study the, the new words that I was being introduced, like being justified. And I came across a very helpful verse. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and the very first verse. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 1. And it says there, If there be a controversy between men, and they come on to judgment, in other words, that they take the matter to court, that the judges may judge them, then they, that is the judges, shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. If there's a case comes to court, and one of the parties is found to be innocent, to be not guilty, the judge justifies him. In other words, the judge says to him, the law has no claim against you, and there is no penalty for you to pay. However, having examined the case, if the judge finds that one of the parties is guilty, he then condemns him, and to be condemned means that the law has a claim against you, and there is a penalty for you to pay. So to be justified, or indeed to be condemned, it's a legal pronouncement by a judge. And we need to keep that in mind as we look at our study tonight. Now, the reasons for the Reformation. Well, I think there were certainly social and political reasons as to why the Reformation came about. I don't think we can really comprehend in this 21st century what conditions were like in Europe in the 16th century. The, the suffocating stranglehold that the Roman Catholic religion had upon the peoples of Europe I don't think we can possibly imagine just the depth uh, of the uh, entanglement that the people had with this religion. It sort of looked after every aspect of their life. And so I, I believe there were reasons, uh, social and political reasons, as to why the people were, were looking to be released from bondage, if I could put it that way. The papacy had unbelievable power. I have a number of books in my office uh, on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Uh, one of them is a classic by Lorraine Bittner, and it's called Roman Catholicism. And he tells about 
what used to happen uh, at the coronation of a new pope. Uh, and I said used to happen, it happened from about the 8th uh, century up until 1978. At one point in the coronation, the Pope was crowned with a three-tier silver tiara. And Butner tells us what the officiating cardinal would have said as this tiara was placed on the Pope's head. Receive the tiara adorned with three crowns and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, ruler of the world, the vicar of our Saviour Jesus Christ. And Butner wrote, the triple crown the Pope wears symbolizes his authority in heaven, on earth, and in the underworld as king of heaven, king of earth, and king of hell. And these were powers that were conferred upon the Pope, and the papacy was not afraid to exercise these powers. And uh, Butner goes on to say that uh, there's records of at least 64 emperors and kings who were deposed at the behest of the Pope. Obviously, if you weren't following the the papal party line, well, they would have got rid of you very, very quickly. Uh, And Pope Pius V, uh, he didn't think much of uh, Elizabeth I, and he issued a bull in which he said, We deprive the Queen of her pretended right to the kingdom, and of all dominion, dignity, and privilege whatsoever. Uh, So he had it in for Queen Elizabeth I, and he also pronounced absolution for any of the nobles who had sworn allegiance to her, but now wanted to change their tune and uh, come under his authority and so on. I I mentioned that the tiara was last used in 1978, and it's probably in cold storage somewhere in the Vatican, Uh, but Uh, It's very interesting that uh, Butner says this. It is also to be borne in mind that though the Church of Rome is silent on her claims, meanwhile, we are not warranted to take that silence for surrender. They are not claims renounced. They are simply claims not asserted. You see, Rome is a master at (coughs) reading the moods of the peoples and trying to conform to that mood not changing any of their doctrines and so on, but seeking to gain popular the tide of popular opinion. And so, as I say, uh, the papacy had unbelievable power in those days, and I think that certainly contributed to the Reformation. However, without a doubt, the main reason for the Reformation was theological and doctrinal. And this is where our friend Martin Luther comes in, because in those days, he was particularly irked by a practice that was uh, being uh, sought and taught all across Europe. There was a man called Tetzel who was going across Europe, and he was selling what were known as indulgences. And I'm sure you know what an indulgence was. It was basically buying forgiveness in advance for sins that you might commit. Uh, You could pay money, you would get this written indulgence that would absolve you from having to do any penance and so on for sins that you would commit. And so the people were coming into the confessional, they were trotting out their uh, list of sins to Martin Luther. He was about to uh, tell them what penance they had to do and then absolve them. And they would whip out the indulgence and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm okay, I don't have to do that. And this really annoyed Martin Luther. Uh, Of course, the the reason for indulgence is it was, in today's parlance, it was a money-making scam. That's all it was. It was designed to raise money to help fund the building of St. Peter's. Luther realized that this was all wrong. And so, on that famous day, almost 500 years ago, on the 31st of October, 1517, He went up to the uh, door of the castle church in Wittenberg and he nailed his 95 theses to the door. Now, first of all, he wasn't vandalizing the door because this wooden door was used as a sort of public notice board. So he wasn't going to get slapped with an ASBO uh, order for for, uh, doing damage to the door. So he did that. And uh, for the modern generation, if you don't know what 95 theses are, maybe if I said 95 bullet points, Uh, You might understand that in computer language. 
And the main thrust, in fact, the, the whole thrust of those 95 theses was arguing against the idea of the sale of indulgences. Now, we need to understand that Martin Luther, his desire was not to create a new uh, religion, uh, a breakaway group to create schism or anything of like that. He was sincerely hoping that perhaps he could see some reformation of the Roman Catholic Church itself. And you find that in his own prologue to the 95 Theses, because this is what he wrote. Out of love and zeal for truth and the desire to bring it to light, the following theses will be publicly discussed at Wittenberg under the chairmanship of the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts in Sacred Theology, and regularly appointed lecturer on these subjects at that place. So he was wanting to discuss these whole things, and he was wanting to discuss in particular the idea of justification, because he had come to see that justification was a pronouncement by God and not a process that starts when you're born, goes through till after you're dead, and continues on in a place called purgatory until eventually God will, in grace and mercy, declare you to be justified. And we're going to see more of that whole system uh, that Rome teaches and so on. So it was all to do with the subject of justification. Now, when I was a child, my parents dutifully sent me along to Sunday school. And one of the things I had to try and do was to learn the shorter catechism. Now, it's amazing that a lot of people, even if they've never tried to learn the shorter catechism, most of them know the first question and the first answer. What is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But if I was to say to them, tell me, what is question 33? Well, they, like me, would have been struggling quite a bit. So to put you out of your misery, number 33 is this. What is justification? And the answer is, justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. That is what it means to be justified. That when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for our salvation, God pardons our sins, he credits, he imputes to our account the very righteousness of Christ. And that is received through the conduit of faith alone. Not through us doing something, it's received by faith alone. And of course, faith itself is a gift from God. The notes in the Catechism go on to say this. Justification means pronouncing a person righteous. It is the opposite of condemnation. And that takes you back to Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. They go on to say, We can do nothing of ourselves to deserve it. The cause of it is not our own goodness. In other words, we play no part in being justified, in keeping justification, in increasing, if it were possible, which it's not, justification. And this is a great difference between biblical truth and what Rome teaches. Because Rome teaches this. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. So Rome believes that by good works we can contribute to our justification, we can preserve it by our good works, and we can actually increase it by our good works. And that, of course, flies in the face of what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. The Bible teaches that ever since the fall, we have a total inability to do anything to save ourselves. Yes, we have a free will to a degree, but our free will is biased towards sin. We're like the bowl that you start off. It starts going straight and then it will veer off to the right or to the left. And that is because our inherent sin nature 
inherited it, if you like, ever since the Garden of Eden, will always take us away from God. There is none that seeketh after God. And so we are spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. But of course, Rome does not teach that. They believe that original sin deprived Adam of a sort of special supernatural substance called grace and that that was taken away from him and that needs to be replaced and replenished and we're going to see that they believe that only they can do it but they also believe that because of our free will we can contribute to the process. Well when this was all happening back uh, in 1517 and the years that followed uh, one of Luther's peers called Erasmus he took a totally <laughs> different view and he believed that man had a will which could contribute to his own salvation and so he wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will and the following year Martin Luther wrote a response in a book called The Bondage of the Will so there was that disagreement all those years ago and I can tell you that there's still the same disagreement to this very day uh, between those who believe that we have a light that sort of flickers within us and can be fanned into life and those of us who believe that as Paul says in Ephesians 2 we were dead in trespasses and in sins. Anyhow it was this whole question of justification it was this whole idea of the sale of indulgences that really was getting to Martin Luther. And one of the books I have uh, in my office is called The Great Reformation by R. Tudor Jones. And he wrote this, it was pastoral concern that moved Luther to act. People had come to make their confessions to him, but they showed no signs of sincere repentance for their sins. On the contrary, they produced copies of indulgences that they had bought and obviously thought of them as licenses to sin with impunity. Luther declined to grant them absolution. He saw that there was no genuine repentance or remorse within their heart. They were simply going through the motions, listing the sins that they had committed. He was about to pronounce penance, if you like, and then give absolution, and they just waved the indulgence. And so that was enough for him. He wouldn't even give them absolution. Number 36 of his 95 Theses sums up his true understanding of what forgiveness is. He said this, Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without letters of indulgence. Luther understood the truth of forgiveness. As far as the East is from the West, that's how far God has removed our sins from us. So what does Rome believe on the subject of forgiveness? Well, the 1994 Catechism of the Catholic Church, I was talking about the shorter catechism, trying to learn it. I would hate to try and learn this one. This is the Catholic Catechism. And in paragraph 1473 of that catechism, uh, there's a heading, The Punishments of Sin. And this is what it says. The forgiveness of sin and restoration of communion with God entail the remission of the eternal punishment of sin, but temporal punishment of sin remains. Do you get that? The forgiveness of sin and the restoration of communion with God entail the remission of the eternal punishment of sin, but temporal punishment of sin remains. So God's going to give, forgive the eternal punishment of your sins, but he's still going to impose temporal punishment for those self-same sins. So what is temporal punishment? Well again, pocket Catholic dictionary by Jesuit John Harden. And this is how temporal punishment is defined. The penalty that God in his justice inflicts either on earth or in purgatory for sins, even though already forgiven as to guilt. So you see what they're saying is, yes, you can have the eternal punishment of your sins forgiven, but God's still going to impose temporal punishment upon you. And of course, the likelihood is that in this life, you will never be able to discharge this temporal punishment. And so you're not bad enough to go to hell, but you're not good enough to go to heaven. So you go to this non-existent place called purgatory 
to discharge the outstanding temporal punishment. Let me give you an example, perhaps, in modern day parlance. Say I'm your school teacher and you're my class. Pastor David here has been giving me a really hard time today. And so I say to David, will you go outside and write out 100 times, I must not annoy the teacher. And so he gets, I know this is totally out of character. He gets to the door and he turns and he says to me, teacher, I'm really, really sorry. Will you forgive me? And I say, of course I'll forgive you, David. But you still have to go outside and write out your 100 lines. He goes outside and he's writing away and he's written out 50 of them. He drops dead. He has paid off 50 of the lines that I gave him, but there's still 50 outstanding. He would have to go to purgatory and suffer to discharge those other 50 lines, or if you kind folks wanted to pay extra money to have masses said for him to speed his journey through purgatory, that would be acceptable. And of course, next month, November, is known in Roman Catholic circles as the Purgatorial Month. This is where there will be lots of special masses said, in particular for those who have died during this preceding year, to speed their journey through purgatory. Sadly, it's another money-making scam. That's the reality. But that, in fact, is Roman Catholic forgiveness. And it's just part of a whole system of so-called forgiveness that Rome has set up over the centuries. I view the Roman Catholic system uh, of salvation as if they view themselves as a spiritual chemist. And keep in mind their understanding of original sin, that when you're born into this world, you're deprived of this supernatural power, invisible substance called grace. And so you need to have that grace restored to you. And so that is why as soon as a baby is born, as quickly as possible, it is taken to the spiritual chemist, the Roman Catholic Church, and there it goes through the sacrament of baptism. And in that sacrament, supposedly that babe is washed clean from the stain of original sin. It is born again. It is made a member of the one true church, and it receives initial justifying grace. So the baby is now in a state of grace. However, once it gets to the early teenage years, well, we all know how teenagers behave, and it begins to sin. And so that initial justifying grace, it has disappeared like snow off the the ditch. And so that teenager has to go through the sacrament of confirmation, and there they will receive what they call strengthening grace to strengthen them for the battles against sin. However, As they progress through the teenage years, the temptations are coming in thick and fast. And that strengthening grace, it disappears too. And so they need to go to the uh, sacrament of of, um, penance or uh, forgiveness, you know, uh, the word confession. That's the word that I was looking for. They need to go to confession. And there they confess their sins. And there they receive reconciling grace. So there they're okay for a wee while. But again, as they finish the teenage years and they get into their 20s and so on, sin again gets rid of all of that reconciling grace. And so their best way of getting back into a state of grace is to be constantly going to the sacrifice of the Mass. And when they go to the sacrifice of the Mass, there they receive what is called pardoning grace. You see, there are people in our province claiming to be Protestants and even ministers who don't seem to understand the difference between the Lord's table and the sacrifice of the Mass. I think in particular of the religious affairs correspondent of the Belfast Telegraph, 
Alf McCreary, and his minister, Mrs. Hughes. And they regularly lament the fact that when they go to a Roman Catholic chapel and the Mass is being celebrated, they are not allowed to partake of the elements. They somehow think it's just the same as a communion service. But the clue's in the name. It is the sacrifice of the Mass. It is not a memorial. It is a sacrifice being perpetuated on an altar. And an altar is a place of sacrifice. And the Roman Catholic people who go to the sacrifice of the Mass are there to obtain forgiveness of sins. Whereas you and I, when we come to the Lord's table and we take the elements, we are taking them as a remembrance for what he did on Calvary and for the fact that we possess forgiveness of sins. It's like chalk and cheese, the Mass and Communion. There is no relationship between them whatsoever. But anyhow, the people are encouraged to go to the Mass regularly to obtain pardoning grace. And then they arrive in the twilight years of life. And the end of life's journey is beckoning. And they need more help. And so they go through the uh, ritual of extreme unction, or it used to be called the last rites. And there they would receive what I call last ditch grace. And everything has gone through. And even after that, I have heard it reported that the priest will usually say to the person, well, it's now between you and your God. There is absolutely no assurance given to that person that you are fit to enter heaven whatsoever. So the spiritual chemist who is Rome, keeps bringing the people back. The sin problem needs constant supplies of grace. And this grace and these graces can only be dispensed by the people who work for the spiritual chemist, and that, of course, is the priests. And the priests get the grace from Mary, because Mary in the catechism is referred to as the mediatrix of all graces. So you have these things, you have actual grace, you have efficacious grace, habitual grace, justifying grace, sacramental grace, sanctifying grace, and sufficient grace. I talked earlier that when I became a Christian, I started to look at terminology to see if I could get a, a real biblical handle on it, and justification was one of those things. But grace is another term that I struggled to try and get a handle on. Because grace in evangelical uh, terminology, in Roman Catholic terminology, in, in Mormon terminology, they all use the same word, but it means very different things. And a very helpful article appeared in the Evangelical Times way back in 1998. I think it was written by a man called Edgar Andrews. No relation, I hasten to add. But this is what he wrote about grace. <coughs> Many think of grace as something actually imparted to the believer. That is, they think of grace as a gift when it is in fact the act of giving, an act which in turn reveals the character of the giver. Grace is that which leads God to deal graciously with his people, an attribute of God rather than something he parts with when he gives. There are those who distort the pivotal truth of what grace really is. They claim that God instills a commodity called grace into people's hearts through various means, rituals, observances, sacraments. Thus grace becomes a gift, a reward for man's obedience and good intentions. And by the grace received, they are enabled to please God and earn salvation. People are saved by grace, they declare, but their particular brand of grace is a reward gift, its ultimate cause lying in their own actions or works. The grace of which Scripture speaks, therefore, is always and only found in God and emphasizes that salvation is utterly of God's free mercy, bestowed on undeserving sinners who were chosen in Christ before time began. Grace describes an attribute of God just as mercy describes an attribute of God. When God is merciful, he doesn't impart 
something called mercy into our system, what he does is he withholds from us that which we truly deserve. And when he is gracious to us, he gives us that which we don't deserve. So when you're converted, in grace, he gives us regeneration, he gives us justification, he gives us sanctification in the sense of setting us apart to God, he gives us adoption into his family, and he will eventually give us glorification when we go to glory. So that is what it means when we are saved by grace. It's due to the gracious actions of God. It's not something that's imparted to us through rituals and sacraments and so on and so forth. So grace is not an actual something given by God. Grace is God actually giving us something. And the most gracious, one of the most gracious gifts of all that he gives us is the indwelling Holy Spirit when we are converted. And it's the Holy Spirit that we look to to help us through all the challenging times of life and so on. So that is my understanding. Now you may see things differently and feel free to talk to me afterwards if you do. But I believe that for me that was a very helpful article to read. The Reformation, I believe, was a retrieval of the gospel of the grace of God. It swept away dependence on mediating priests. We didn't have to go to some priest to offer a sacrifice so that we could get our sins forgiven. You know, that's just like the Old Testament, where the Jew would go up to the temple and there would be a sacrifice selected and the priest would offer it in order for him to obtain sacrifice. The Roman Catholic priesthood is nothing more than the Aaronic priesthood dressed up in different garments. That's all that it is. So it swept away that, and it swept away the dependence upon Judaizing type sacraments. Uh, people, I've heard some strange uh, assessments of the letter to the Galatians. In particular, there was two uh, former moderators of the Presbyterian Church who came out with the line that the letter to the Galatians had nothing to do with soteriology, in other words, the doctrine of salvation. But they said, rather, it was all to do with church membership. That's what they said. Have they never read Acts chapter 15 and verse 1? This is what Luke says. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So this insistence by the Judaizers that in addition to faith in Christ you needed to be circumcised, it was everything to do with soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. It wasn't a question of ecclesiology. One denomination believes this and one denomination believes that. No, it was to do with salvation. And yet there are people who say, no, that's not what it was about. But anyhow, the Reformation swept away all of that. It said, uh, just like Paul said, you don't need the Old Testament ritualistic observance. And so this Reformation swept away dependence upon rituals. And yet, in paragraph 1129 of this Catholic Catechism, it says the uh, sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. Rome says that all of their sacraments are necessary for salvation. So there's no difference between them and the old Judaizers. It swept away doubt about eternity. If you were born again and saved, you knew exactly where you were going when you died. It restored Christ as the only and sole head of the church. Uh, I have another catechism uh, called Butler's Catechism, an old Irish one, and it says, who is the head of the church? And it says, the Pope is the visible head of the church. Well, I'm sorry. No, whether visible or invisible, there's only one head of the church, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, as we find in Colossians chapter 1. It restored Christ as the sole mediator of salvation. You don't go through the priests. You don't go through Mary. You don't go through the saints. 
Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It restored glory to his finished sacrifice. There's no more sacrifice for sin. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. He doesn't continue to be dying on a Roman Catholic altar. He's seated in glory. And it restored God's word as the sole authority that governs the life and conduct of a Christian. In the Catechism, Rome says the Bible and sacred tradition make up a single deposit of the Word of God. So they have dual authority, the Bible and this unwritten oral <coughs> tradition. But even those two are not the supreme authority in Roman Catholicism. The supreme authority is the magisterium, the Pope and the Cardinals, because they will tell you what the Bible means and they will tell you what constitutes sacred tradition. That was all done away with. Luther, as we will see shortly, he stuck to the book. Sinners now knew once again the glorious truth of how a man can be justified by God. And of course, if a Roman Catholic came to the new birth experience and was sure that they were heaven bound, if they went to the priest and said, I've got great news, I know exactly where I'm going, I'm going to heaven when I die. Well, the priest, if he was being honest, would have had to say to them, well, I'm sorry, I have bad news for you, uh, because you cannot presume that. And later in the Council of Trent, which we will look at just in a wee minute, they said this, if anyone says that he will for certain with an absolute and infallible certainty have that great gift of perseverance even to the end, unless he shall have learned this by a special revelation, let him be anathema. In other words, if a Roman Catholic was saved and shared the good news with the priest, the priest would say, I have bad news for you. That sin is going to take you straight to hell. Because, of course, Rome categorizes sins between venial sins, which are less serious and would take you to purgatory, and mortal sins, which will take you straight to hell. And to presume that you're going to heaven when you die is classed as a mortal sin. So I think there was definitely a, a theological and doctrinal reason for the Reformation, but I think there was also growing dissatisfaction with the people with the so-called message of salvation that was being put about by the Roman Catholic religion. I, I think the Reformation was a divine blessing waiting to happen. Uh, going back to my book, The Great Reformation, it says this, all in all, the Protestant Reformation was as fundamental a transformation as Christianity has ever experienced. And for individuals, as in the case of Luther himself, it meant rediscovery of a gracious God and a saving Christ. It is this spiritual principle that lies at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. Well, I, of course, Rome wasn't going to take all of this lying down. And of course, they challenged Luther uh, over a number of years and eventually in the early part of 1521 they excommunicated him and then a few months later they summoned him to the tribunal the dad of worms and of course what they were wanting him to do was to recount to say okay I take back all that I have been saying so he had been asked to recount uh, and this was his reply and uh, it's in quite quaint English because it's taken from Fox's book of martyrs this is what Luther said Considering your sovereign majesty and your honours require a plain answer, this I say and profess as resolutely as I may, that if I be not convinced by the testimonies of the Scriptures, for I believe not the Pope, neither his general councils, which have erred many times and have been contrary to themselves, my conscience is so bound and captive in these Scriptures and the Word of God that I will not nor may not revoke any manner of thing. Considering it is not godly or lawful to do anything against conscience. Hereupon I stand and rest. I have not what else to do. God have mercy upon me. 
So Luther was determined that he would not take back one jot or tittle of what he had written or said because his conscience was captive to the word of God. So that was the, the reason, I believe, for the Reformation. And then secondly, the reaction to the Reformation. Well, basically Rome reverted to form. Whenever Rome is challenged on issues, whether it's teachings or doctrines or whatever, she is fond of convening councils, assembling the, the Pope and the Cardinals and the Archbishops and so on, and uh, examining in depth the issues that have to be addressed. <coughs> and so some 28 years after Luther nailed his 95 Theses in December 1545, they convened the Council of Trent. Trent is a, a city in the north of Italy, and it lasted for just a week or two under 18 years. It spanned the, the, the reign of three popes, and there were no less than 25 sessions during that council. And in that, they examined every aspect of teaching and practice in the Roman Catholic religion. And so, in relation to the Council of Trent, I want to hang my thoughts on two words. Codification and condemnation. So, codification. What does it mean to codify? Well, it means to set down in writing what exactly you believe on an issue. And so... Trent, as I say, it lasted all those years and it had all those sessions, so they examined things like what constituted the scriptures, the written scriptures. And of course, yes, they will go with our books, but then they added in the apocryphal books, which had previously been rejected uh, in centuries earlier. Uh, the reason they accepted these extra books was that they felt that they would uh, form the basis of some of their heretical teaching, and I think in particular of purgatory. They defined the importance and the role of tradition being on a par with scripture. They defined their understanding of original sin and they affirmed free will, free unfettered will. They affirmed baptismal regeneration and they put out their understanding in particular of justification which, as I say, was very much at the heart of Luther's concern. They explained the mechanisms, if you like, of their sacraments and so on, and they emphasized in particular what they believe happens during the Mass. And, of course, in the Mass they believe that when the priest says words of consecration, that the bread and the wine are somehow miraculously transformed into the body, blood, soul, divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I remember back in 2012, I was doing a, a TV debate for an hour with a Roman Catholic spokesperson on the subject of the Mass. And he was talking about this miracle of transubstantiation, where the innermost being of the bread and the wine is supposed to be transformed into Christ himself. And he was going on about this miracle. And I said, his name was Peter. I said, Peter, there are quite a number of miracles recorded in the Bible. I said, can you give me an example of a miracle that is found in the Bible that could not be verified by one of our natural senses? Because when the water was turned into wine, you could taste the difference. When somebody was raised from the dead, you could see that they were alive. When somebody got their hearing back, it was evident that they could now hear where previously they couldn't. So I said to him, can you give an example of a miracle which could not be verified by one of our natural senses. And of course he couldn't do it. And I said, yet you're expecting people to believe the miracle of transubstantiation, even though the bread and the wine still look like bread and wine, even though the bread and the wine still taste like bread and wine. And if you leave the bread long enough, I'm sure it would go moldy, etc. So he couldn't do it. So they codified all of these things. It was the first time, really, that everything that Rome believes was set out. There was codification. But then I said there was condemnation. Because if you didn't believe all that they had codified, then you were going to be in big trouble, according to Rome. If you take 
for instance, this idea of transubstantiation. This is what they say. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is in it only as in a sign or figure or force, let him be anathema. In other words, if you don't believe that these elements have literally been transubstantiated into Christ himself, then you are under the curse of God. And of course, this was the central reason that the reformers were burned in England. If you ever read J.C. Ryle's book, Why Were Our Reformers Burned? Those godly men refused to accept the teaching of transubstantiation. And for that, they were burned at the stake. So, as I say, there was a codification and there was condemnation. Uh, at the very end of the Council of Trent, then in the wake of it, they published the Tridentine Creed of Pius IV. It was a kind of summary of all that was in the Council of Trent documents. Uh, these, in fact, that, that's a copy of all of the documents and so on that were published, but they had a sort of shorter version, the Tridentine Creed, which affirmed all of their teachings and then at the end it says, This true Catholic faith without which no one can be saved, I do at this present freely confess and sincerely hold. So anyone wanting to become a Roman Catholic would have to affirm their acceptance of every teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I think of a couple of politicians who in our living uh, time have converted to Roman Catholicism. And Whittacombe uh, is one. And Anne Whittacom, I, I have a respect for her in this respect. She is a zealous Roman Catholic. She has a zeal for God, but sadly it's not according to knowledge. But she stands for what she believes. So she was one politician who converted to Rome. But then there was another man called Tony Blair, who when he left office, he then officially became a Roman Catholic. And about a year after he became a Roman Catholic, he started talking publicly about how the Vatican would have to rethink the whole gay issue. You know, that was 2,000 years ago. We need to get up to date. So he was trying to tell the Pope what he should be doing. And who took him publicly to task? Anne Whittacombe. Because she reminded him that when both of them joined the Roman Catholic Church, they both accepted all of the teachings of the Church. And she was reminding him of what he had sworn to do. So, as I say, there was codification and there was condemnation. But then there's also what I would call countering and culling. Rome needed to counter this new movement, this Protestantism that was sweeping across Europe. And so they sanctioned the setting up of an organization called the Society of Jesus, and we know them better as the Jesuits. They were formed by Ignatius Loyola. And these people basically became the stormtroopers, if you like, of the Vatican. They were tasked with leading the counter-reformation. And that's what they were set up to do. And I can tell you that they are still doing that to this day. A good brother in the Lord in South Africa, Sean Wilcock, he wrote a book called The Jesuits, The Secret army of the papacy and here's just a, a couple of things uh, that he wrote uh, in his book throughout the inquisition and other means the devil sought to wipe out the church of christ then with the formation of the jesuit order in the 16th century a new and deadly weapon was created to be used against biblical uh, christianity Never has a more fanatical and powerful society existed upon the earth. It is particularly against Protestantism that the Jesuits have directed all their venom. In 1551, the Council of Trent sent secret instructions to the Jesuits of Paris on how to undermine and destroy the Church of England. Jesuit spies trained on the continent furtively spread throughout England during Elizabeth's reign in various disguises under fictitious names, preaching, hearing confessions, giving mass. As late as 1594, at least seven Jesuits plotted to murder Elizabeth. Some of them confessed to the plot. 
1597, there were Jesuit spies within the English cabinet itself. So the Jesuits were set up to counter the Reformation. But I also mentioned culling. And I'm sure you know what a cull is. A cull is when you go out and you select a species and you kill a large number of them. Whether it's badgers or seal pups or whatever. And so again Rome reverted to form. Because in earlier centuries when their authority and beliefs had been <coughs> challenged they had no hesitation in culling the people who were not <coughs> accepting their teachings. And I think in the 13th century of a group called the Albigenses, and they were hauled before the Inquisition, as it was called, and they were tried as heretics. And of course, they were found guilty, and so they were put to death. And in the time of the Reformation itself, between 1540 and 1570, it's estimated that 900,000 of a group called the Waldenses in the north of Italy were put to death. And then in 1572 in France, you had the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre of Protestant Huguenots. And that was authorised by Pope Gregory XIII, who was so pleased with the outcome that he struck a medal with his image on one side and people being slaughtered on the other side. So Rome was determined to stop this reformation in its tracks. And so uh, it countered it by setting up the Jesuits, and it culled those who were against it. And of course, Rome today has, for the first time, their first ever Jesuit priest. So they basically hold the two top offices in the Vatican. And it was interesting, there was a, a conference earlier this year at the Ligonier National Conference. One of the guest speakers was Leonardo di Circhio, the Italian ev evangelical pastor of the Church Breccia di Roma. And this is what he said. This is an Italian convert saying this. With Pope Francis, the Jesuit order comes to us with a smiling face, but always carrying with him not only the tradition but also the goal of the Jesuit order to dismantle, to deconstruct the Protestant Reformation, and to offer a Roman Catholic alternative. When it comes to Rome and the Jesuits, there is no new thing under the sun. So we have codification and condemnation, we have countering and culling, and then another reaction was censoring. And again, Rome reverted to form. She reaffirmed that their followers were not allowed to read certain books. And in particular, they were not allowed to read the scriptures. And uh, in the Council of Trent, they said this. No one relying on his own judgment shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the holy scriptures in accordance with his own conceptions, Presumed to interpret them contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of their true sense and interpretation, has held and holds, or even contrary to the unanimous teaching of the fathers. In other words, if you did happen to get your hand on a Bible, you could read it, but you weren't allowed to interpret it at all, if, particularly if your interpretation was contrary to the teaching of Mother Church. And Pope Paul VI reaffirmed that in 1971. Now, the rules were relaxed a bit in Vatican II as regards giving the people access to the scriptures. But the rule against interpretation still holds good. You're not allowed to interpret it. The only one who can interpret it for you is the priest, and he must simply pass on what the magisterium have said a passage happens to me. And of course, Rome has actually <coughs> made very little by way of commentary on the scriptures, uh, except in a few crucial uh, spots that suit their own particular teachings. So the immediate reaction, if you like, to the Reformation was the Council of Trent, the codification, the condemnation, then the establishment of the Jesuits, the countering, uh, the reconvening of the Inquisition to call and the reaffirmation of censorship. 
Has there been more reaction in more recent times? Yes, there has been. In the middle of the 19th century, they had another council, and that was Vatican I. And what was one of the first things they did when they got this great council of Vatican I together? The Council of Trent was reaffirmed by Vatican I. Vatican I reaffirmed everything that had been stated in the Council of Trent. But they also did two other things, and this related to the Pope. First of all, they declared that he was infallible when it came to speaking on matters of faith or morals. And then not only was he infallible, they basically made, meant, uh, made him untouchable. This is what they said. The Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. That sounds a bit like the leader of North Korea. That's the sort of power he was, and it's the sort of power I think that Donald Trump would love to have, but doesn't have. So Vatican I basically made the Pope infallible, untouchable, but it reaffirmed everything in the Council of Trent. And then in the lifetime of quite a number here tonight, there was another great council, and that was Vatican II. It was convened in 1962 at the behest of the smiling Pope John XXIII. And it lasted for just over three years, and they had uh, four sessions. And what was one of the first things they said? This sacred council accepts loyally the venerable faith of our ancestors who are in the glory of heaven or who are yet being purified after their death. In other words, they're still in purgatory. And it proposes again the decrees of the Council of Trent. So Trent has been reaffirmed by Vatican I and Vatican II. I've heard people say to me, oh, Trent doesn't apply any longer. Don't you believe it? Trent has been reaffirmed time after time. So what was the main purpose of Vatican II? Well, I think it was a public relations marketing exercise. I told you earlier about the tiara being put into cold storage and it's no longer used when popes are being uh, installed. And I think they realized that this is a bit too much for today's generation to accept. So we'll just stash it away until a more convenient time. And what they set out to do was to rebrand Roman Catholicism, to, to repackage it, to, to change the outward wrapping paper to make it more appealing to people in this generation. But what was at the heart of it did not change one iota. In fact, between Vatican I and Vatican II, the teachings of Rome had got even worse because in 1950, past the 12th, had uh, declared the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. So Rome was on a PR exercise. She was seeking to seduce back into its ranks those who had previously been called heretics but were now known as separated brethren. That's you and me. And so they felt that by doing and adopting this approach they could make even more possible the reversal of the Reformation. But for that to happen, they were going to, need to the, going to need the help of liberal, ecumenical, so-called Protestant ministers and pastors. And we're going to see tomorrow night just how they have been successful in that area as we will look tomorrow night at reversal of the Reformation and rejoicing in the Reformation. But tonight we have looked at the reasons for the Reformation and the reaction to the Reformation. And we thank God. Now Martin Luther, I have to say, he wasn't a perfect saint by any means. And sadly, there were things that he wrote, particularly concerning the Jewish people, which <coughs> I think we would want to distance ourselves from them. But he was the instrument that God used to rediscover the truth of justification and that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone and to the glory of God alone. And so in this Reformation week, we do give thanks for what God...